Margaret awoke, startled, a cold sweat clinging to her. She gathered her thoughts. Aged wood creaked, echoing through the quiet rooms. Near the house stood a shrine to Rhea Dana, goddess and daughter of the land, of Rhea and a being of comfort. Margaret sought answers. But the goddess did not speak. There was only the faint whisper of something dark, something hungry. The old seer's bones felt the weight of their age as she climbed. The only thought on her mind, has it begun again? John's mission would be a simple one. He was to investigate Rhea's greatest shrine. His mother presented him with a fresh divinity shard. From his brother came a newly sharpened sword. His wife gave him a kiss, and his daughter's hugs were full of reason to return home safe. forgotten, a place of unimaginable beauty. It first appeared as sludge given life, slithering creatures, small and vile.
wall. Impeding further progress, a battle was certain. Vanished by light itself, the corruption abated, leaving the shard cold in hand, dark in need of life. The shard grew warm, humming softly from the harnessed energy. Before him was now one more dangerous than those that came before. Oh! 
Goblins, a familiar threat, albeit farther out than usual. Inherently violent and ill-bathed, the goblins were an unfocused, but constant threat. Magnificent, but dangerous, a land of love found and of love lost. Before him was sacred ground, left untouched in days gone by. Remaining calm and collected, the shock of his heart skipping beats was concealed in expert fashion. Before him stood Linda, his eldest daughter, with bow and quiver at the ready, determined to do her part. Before the Guardians were not beasts feeding, but monsters consuming, destroying others, they corrupted and distorted, creating even more hungry husks. Both father and daughter gathered their thoughts, their hearts heavier than before. How would they explain what they had witnessed?
the ancient tree had been cut down. Together, father and daughter described the horror, the creatures dripping with decay that slithered into bodies stuck between life and death to bolster their ranks. Grandma Margaret confirmed what they all feared. It was the corruption. A cruel entity spoken of only with hushed voices. An ocean of darkness that flowed from the top of Mount Morta. And the Bergson's duty was to stand against this devouring deluge of death. Kevin was also eager to do his part in the family's fight. Especially when his older brother Mark was off somewhere. He was as much a guardian of their mountain home as any of them. She stood. If they were to reach the summit and destroy this evil, as the Bergsons of old had done in the past, they would need the assistance of the sanctuary. Given to the Bergsons by Rhea herself, the sanctuary was a gateway to the mysterious lands around the mountain. Margaret pointed to the huge crystal at the center of the den, revealing their next task, to activate it and open the way to the source of the corruption. And once Rhea's three spirits are gathered on the grounds, the only gate to the top of Mount Morta will open in this chamber. By himself, or with the assistance of those who loved him, John needed to gather the three spirits from their lands. Without them, he would not be able to stem the flow of the corruption. A celestial shard chipped directly from the ancient crystal in the sanctuary. It would be the Bergson's lifeline 
a tether to pull them back home before death's fateful whisper. Bergson began to slip away, wondering if this was death. Celestial Shard brought them back, a sensation no hero could become accustomed to. As she heard John and Linda describe their foray, thoughts rushed through Margaret's head. The corruption had amplified the creature's wickedness, and no longer were they part of the harmony of the Rhea. With the new threats looming, Margaret asked Ben to prepare his workshop. He would have to take charge of enhancing the warrior family's weapons and armor. Uncle Ben reached out to the familiar warmth of the forge. If they were to reach the top of Mount Morta, their equipment would need to be of the highest quality.
on calm days such as these, Mary enjoyed venturing into the nearby grove. The woodland creatures came out to lend her company. The smallest ate from her basket while she took in the serenity of it all.
The halls of Anea Dyer, so mesmerizing in their magnificence, were to be found at the end of a long road. And a hero never knows what is awaiting them at the end of a road. Moving is more important than reaching. Kevin's need to help all began when his elder brother Mark left the house. His brother was strong, making any near him feel safe. But he left Kevin. Though Uncle Ben knew what his nephew needed, a focal point for his aspirations. Uncle Ben pondered over a map he received from a refugee. 
The silk caverns were a twisted maze of dead ends and venomous nests. But somewhere along the right path, Anea Dyer, spirit of the Caldipo Caves, rested.
The thinnest strands of white fibers coated the ground and walls, evidence of the silk caverns living up to their name. A set of daggers made just for him. They would be his guide to finding himself, his focal point. The boy tested them. They felt good, not too heavy, not too light, like an extension of himself. Uncle Ben suggested a few practice swings outside. The daggers sliced the air guided with an easy grace. His nephew was clearly a natural with the blades and would be ready to join his father and sister in no time. But the boy's mother had words on that subject. Two of her children were already risking their lives and she would not have her precious little boy out there as well. Regretfully, he took the daggers away. Who was he to argue with a mother when it involved her child? Handing over the daggers was like abandoning a part of himself. He was meant for them, meant to be out there fighting for what was right. He just needed to convince them. Lucy could spend hours with paper and pencil, giving life to objects she witnessed in the clouds, drowning herself in her own world, a place empty of life's trials and tribulations, the way from Grandma Margaret, who's always insisting that she continue to practice her other specialty. Nothing could quite match the calm that Linda felt when playing her violin. Its sublime sound, the perfect counter to the nerve-wracking uncertainty and chaos.
Worried for the missing boy, Ben thought that maybe he should have hidden the daggers better. Margaret, in her wisdom, knew that nothing would have remained hidden from Kevin forever. Now, she only encouraged her son and his daughter to hurry and find him. <laughs> 